Section 6 of Self-Help This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hope Force One Self-Help with Illustrations of Conduct and Perseverance by Samuel Smiles Chapter 2 Leaders of Industry, Inventors and Producers, Part 3 The Luddites seem to have been encouraged by the lenity of the sentences pronounced on such of their confederates as had been apprehended and tried, and, shortly after, the mania broke out afresh, and rapidly extended over the northern and midland manufacturing districts. The organization became more secret. An oath was administered to the members binding them to obedience to the orders issued by the heads of the confederacy, and the betrayal of their designs was decreed to be death. All machines were doomed by them to destruction, whether employed in the manufacture of clothes, calico, or lace, and a reign of terror began which lasted for years. In Yorkshire and Lancashire, mills were boldly attacked by armed rioters, and in many cases they were wrecked or burnt, so that it became necessary to guard them by soldiers and yeomanry. The masters themselves were doomed to death, many of them were assaulted and some were murdered. At length the law was vigorously set in motion, numbers of the misguided Luddites were apprehended, some were executed, and after several years' violent commotion from this cause, the machine-breaking riots were at length quelled. Among the numerous manufacturers whose works were attacked by the Luddites was the inventor of the bobbin net machine himself. One bright, sunny day, in the summer of 1816, a body of rioters entered his factory at Lowborough with torches and set fire to it, destroying 37 lace machines and above 10,000 pounds worth of property. Ten of the men were apprehended for the felony and eight of them were executed. Mr. Heathcote made a claim upon the county for compensation and it was resisted. But the court of Queen's Bench decided in his favour, and decreed that the county must make good his loss of ten thousand pounds. The magistrates sought to couple with the payment of the damage the condition that Mr. Heathcote should expend the money in the county of Leicester. But to this he would not assent, having already resolved on removing his manufacture elsewhere. At Tiverton, in Devonshire, he found a large building which had been formerly used as a woollen manufactory. But the Tiverton clothes trade, having fallen into decay, the building remained unoccupied and the town itself was generally in a very poverty-stricken condition. Mr. Heathcote bought the old mill, renovated and enlarged it, and there recommenced the manufacture of lace, upon a larger scale than before, keeping in full work as many as 300 machines, and employing a large number of artisans at good wages. Not only did he carry on the manufacture of lace, but the various branches of business connected with it, yarn doubling, silk spinning, net making and finishing. He also established at Tiverton an iron foundry and works for the manufacture of agricultural implements, which proved of great convenience to the district. It was a favorite idea of his that steam power was capable of being applied to perform all the heavy drudgery of life, and he labored for a long time at the invention of a steam plow. In 1832, he so far completed his invention as to be enabled to take out a patent for it, and Heathcote's steam plow, though it has since been superseded by Fowler's, was considered the best machine of the kind that had up to that time been invented. 
Mr. Heathcote was a man of great natural gifts. He possessed a sound understanding, quick perception, and a genius for business of the highest order. With these he combined uprightness, honesty, and integrity, qualities which are the true glory of human character. Himself a diligent self-educator, he gave ready encouragement to the serving youths in his employment, stimulating their talents and fostering their energies. During his own busy life, he contrived to save time to master French and Italian, of which he acquired an accurate and grammatical knowledge. His mind was largely stored with the results of a careful study of the best literature, and there were few subjects on which he had not formed for himself shrewd and accurate views. The two thousand workpeople in his employment regarded him almost as a father, and he carefully provided for their comfort and improvement. Prosperity did not spoil him, as it does so many, nor close his heart against the claims of the poor and struggling, who were always sure of his sympathy and help. To provide for the education of the children of his workpeople, he built schools for them at a cost of about £6,000. He was also a man of singularly cheerful and buoyant disposition, a favourite with men of all classes and most admired and beloved by those who knew him best. In 1831, the electors of Tiverton, of which town Mr. Heathcote had proved himself so genuine a benefactor, returned him to represent them in Parliament, and he continued their member for nearly thirty years. During a great part of that time, he had Lord Palmerston for his colleague, and the noble lord, on more than one public occasion, expressed the high regard which he entertained for his venerable friend. On retiring from the representation in 1859, Owing to advancing age and the increasing infirmities, 1,300 of his workmen presented him with a silver inkstand and gold pen, in token of their esteem. He enjoyed his leisure for only two more years, dying in January 1861, at the age of 77, and leaving behind him a character for probity, virtue, manliness, and mechanical genius, of which his descendants may well be proud. We next turn to a career of a very different kind, that of the illustrious but unfortunate Jacquard, whose life also illustrates in a remarkable manner the influence which ingenious men, even of the humblest rank, may exercise upon the industry of a nation. Jacquard was the son of a hard-working couple of lions, his father being a weaver and his mother a pattern reader. They were too poor to give him any but the most meager education. When he was of age to learn a trade, his father placed him with a bookbinder, an old clerk who made up the master's accounts, gave Jacquard some lessons in mathematics. He very shortly began to display a remarkable turn for mechanics, and some of his contrivances quite astonished the old clerk, who advised Jacquard's father to put him to some other trade, in which his peculiar abilities might have better scope than in bookbinding. He was accordingly put apprentice to a cutler, but was so badly treated by his master that he shortly afterwards left his employment on which he was placed with a type founder. His parents dying, Jacquard found himself in a measure compelled to take his father's two looms and carry on the trade of a weaver. He immediately proceeded to improve the looms and became so engrossed with his inventions that he forgot his work and very soon found himself at the end of his means. He then sold the looms to pay his debts at the same time that he took upon himself the burden of supporting a wife. He became still poorer, and to satisfy his creditors, he next sold his cottage. He tried to find employment, but in vain. People believing him to be an idler, 
occupied with mere dreams about his inventions. At length he obtained employment with a linemaker of Bress, whither he went, his wife remaining at Lyons, earning a precarious living by making straw bonnets. We hear nothing further of Jacquard for some years, but in the interval he seems to have prosecuted his improvement in the draw loom for the better manufacture of figured fabrics. For, in 1790, he brought out his contrivance for selecting the warp threads, which, when added to the loom, superseded the services of a draw boy. The adoption of this machine was slow but steady, and in ten years after its introduction, four thousand of them were found at work in Lyons. Jacquard's pursuits were rudely interrupted by the revolution, and in 1792 we find him fighting in the ranks of the Lyonnais volunteers against the army of the convention under the command of Dubois Crancet. The city was taken, Jacquard fled and joined the army of the Rhine where he rose to the rank of sergeant. He might have remained a soldier, but that, his only son having been shot dead at his side, he deserted and returned to Lyons to recover his wife. He found her in a garret still employed at her old trade of straw bonnet making. While living in concealment with her, his mind reverted to the inventions over which he had so long brooded in former years but he had no means wherewith to prosecute them. Jacquard found it necessary, however, to emerge from his hiding place and try to find some employment. He succeeded in obtaining it with an intelligent manufacturer, and while working by day, he went on inventing by night. It had occurred to him that great improvements might still be introduced in looms for figured goods, and he incidentally mentioned the subject one day to his master, regretting at the same time that his limited means prevented him from carrying out his ideas. Happily, his master appreciated the value of the suggestions, and with laudable generosity placed a sum of money at his disposal, that he might prosecute the proposed improvements at his leisure. In three months, Jacquard had invented a loom to substitute mechanical action for the irksome and toilsome labor of the workmen. The loom was exhibited at the Exposition of National Industry at Paris in 1801 and obtained a bronze medal. Jacquard was further honored by a visit at Lyons from the minister Carnot who decided to congratulate him in person on the success of his invention. In the following year, the Society of Arts in London offered a prize for the invention of a machine for manufacturing fishing nets and boarding netting for ships. Jacquard heard of this, and while walking one day in the fields according to his custom, he turned the subject over in his mind and contrived a plan of a machine for the purpose. His friend, the manufacturer, again furnished him with the means of carrying out his idea and in three weeks Jacquard had completed his invention. Jacquard's achievement, having come to the knowledge of the prefect of the department, he was summoned before that functionary, and, on his explanation of the working of the machine, a report on the subject was forwarded to the emperor. The inventor was forthwith summoned to Paris with his machine, and brought into the presence of the emperor, who received him with the consideration due to his genius. The interview lasted two hours, during which Jacquard, placed at his ease by the emperor's affability, explained to him the improvements which he proposed to make in the looms for weaving figured goods. The result was that he was provided with apartments in the Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers, where he had the use of the workshop during his stay and was provided with suitable allowance for maintenance. Installed in the conservatoire, Jacquard proceeded to complete the details of his improved loom. He had the advantage of minutely inspecting the various exquisite pieces of mechanism contained in that great treasury of human ingenuity. 
Among the machines which more particularly attracted his attention and eventually set him upon the track of his discovery was a loom for weaving flowered silk made by Vaucanson, the celebrated automaton maker. Vaucanson was a man of the highest order of constructive genius. The inventive faculty was so strong in him that it may almost be said to have amounted to a passion and could not be restrained. The saying that the poet is born, not made, applies with equal force to the inventor who, though indebted like the other to culture and improved opportunities, nevertheless contrives and constructs new combinations of machinery mainly to gratify his own instinct. This was peculiarly the case with Vacanson, for his most elaborate works were not so much distinguished for their utility as for the curious ingenuity which they displayed. While a mere boy attending Sunday conversations with his mother, he amused himself by watching, through the chinks of a partition wall, part of the movements of a clock in the adjoining apartment. He endeavoured to understand them, and by brooding over the subject, after several months, he discovered the principle of the escapement. From that time, the subject of mechanical invention took complete possession of him. With some rude tools which he contrived, he made a wooden clock that marked the hours with remarkable exactness, while he made for a miniature chapel the figures of some angels which waved their wings, and some priests that made several ecclesiastical movements. With a view of executing some other automata he had designed, he proceeded to study anatomy, music, and mechanics, which occupied him for several years. The sight of the flute player in the gardens of the Tuileries inspired him with the resolution to invent a similar figure that should play and after several years' study and labour, though struggling with illness, he succeeded in accomplishing his object. He next produced a flagulet player, which was succeeded by a duck, the most ingenious of his contrivances, which swam, doubled, drank, and quacked like a real duck. He next invented an asp, employed in the tragedy of Cleopatra, which hissed and darted at the bosom of the actress. Vaucanson, however, did not confine himself merely to the making of automata. By reason of his ingenuity, Cardinal de Fleury uh, appointed him inspector of the silk manufactories of France, and he was no sooner in office than with his usual irrepressible instinct to invent he proceeded to introduce improvements in silk machinery. One of these was his mill for thrown silk, which so excited the anger of the lion's operatives, who feared the loss of employment through its means, that they pelted him with stones and had nearly killed him. He nevertheless went on inventing, and next produced a machine for weaving flowered silks, with a contrivance for giving a dressing to the thread so as to render that of each bobbin or skein of an equal thickness. When Vacanson died in 1782, after a long illness, he bequeathed his collection of machines to the Queen, who seems to have set but small value on them, and they were shortly after dispersed. But his machine for weaving flowered silks was happily preserved in the Conservatoire des Arts des Métiers, and here Jacquard found it among the many curious and interesting articles in the collection. It proved of the utmost value to him, for it immediately set him on the track of the principal modification which he introduced in his improved loom. One of the chief features of Vacanson's machine was a pierced cylinder which, according to the holes it presented when revolved, regulated the movement of certain needles and caused the threads of the warp to deviate in such a manner as to produce a given design, though only of a simple character. Jacquard 
seized upon the suggestion with avidity, and, with the genius of the true inventor, at once proceeded to improve upon it. At the end of a month, his weaving machine was completed. To the cylinder of Van Kansen, he added an endless piece of pasteboard pierced with a number of holes, through which the thread of the warp were presented to the weaver, while another piece of mechanism indicated to the workman the color of the shuttle which he ought to throw. Thus the drawboy and the reader of the signs were both at once superseded. The first use Chacard made of his new loom was to weave with it several yards of rich stuff, which he presented to the Empress Josephine. Napoleon was highly gratified with the result of the inventor's labors and ordered a number of the looms to be constructed by the best workmen after Jacquard's model and presented to him after which he returned to Lyons. There he experienced the frequent fate of inventors. He was regarded by his townsmen as an enemy and treated by them as Kay, Hargreaves and Arkwright had been in Lancashire. The workmen looked upon the new loom as fatal to their trade, and feared lest it should at once take the bread from their mouths. A tumultuous meeting was held on the place de Terror, when it was determined to destroy the machines. This was however prevented by the military, but Jacquard was denounced and hanged in effigy. The Conseil de Prudhommes in vain endeavoured to allay the excitement, and they were themselves denounced. At length, carried away by the popular impulse, the Prudhommes, most of whom had been workmen and sympathised with the class, had one of Jacquard's looms carried off and publicly broken in pieces. Riots followed, in one of which Jacquard was dragged along the quay by an infuriated mob intending to drown him, but he was rescued. The great value of the Jacquard loom, however, could not be denied, and its success was only a question of time. Jacquard was urged by some English silk manufacturers to pass over into England and settle there, but notwithstanding the harsh and cruel treatment he had received at the hands of his townspeople, his patriotism was too strong to permit him to accept their offer. The English manufacturers, however, adopted his loom. Then it was, and only then, that Lyons, threatened to be beaten out of the field, adopted it with eagerness, and before long the Jacquard machine was employed in nearly all kinds of weaving. The result proved that the fears of the work people had been entirely unfounded. Instead of diminishing employment, the Jacquard loom increased it at least tenfold. The number of persons occupied in the manufacture of figured goods in Lyons was stated by M. Leon Forcher to have been 60,000 in 1833, and that number has since been considerably increased. As for Jacquard himself, the rest of his life passed peacefully excepting that the workpeople who dragged him along the quay to drown him were shortly after found eager to bear him in triumph along the same road in celebration of his birthday. But his modesty would not permit him to take part in such a demonstration. The Municipal Council of Lyons proposed to him that he should devote himself to improving his machine for the benefit of the local industry to which Jacquard agreed in consideration of a moderate pension, the amount of which was fixed by himself. After perfecting his invention accordingly, he retired at sixty to end his days at Olin's, his father's native place. It was there that he received, in 1820, the decoration of the Legion of Honor, and it was there that he died and was buried in 1834. A statue was erected to his memory, but his relatives remained in poverty, and twenty years after his death, his two nieces were under the necessity of selling for a few hundred francs 
the gold medal bestowed upon their uncle by Louis the Eighteenth. Such, says a French writer, was the gratitude of the manufacturing interests of Lyons to the man to whom it owes so large a portion of its splendor. It would be easy to extend the martyrology of inventors and to cite the names of other equally distinguished men who have, without any corresponding advantage to themselves, contributed to the industrial progress of the age. For it has too often happened that genius has planted the tree of which patient dullness has gathered the fruit, but we will confine ourselves for the present to a brief account of an inventor of comparatively recent date, by way of illustration of the difficulties and privations which it is so frequently the lot of mechanical genius to surmount. We allude to Joshua Haleman, the inventor of the combing machine. Haleman was born in 1796 at Mulhouse, the principal seat of the Alsace cotton manufacture. His father was engaged in that business, and Joshua entered his office at 15. He remained there for two years, employing his spare time in mechanical drawing. He afterwards spent two years in his uncle's banking house in Paris, prosecuting the study of mathematics in the evenings. Some of his relatives having established a small cotton spinning factory at Mulhouse, young Hielman was placed with Messieurs Tissot and Ray at Paris to learn the practice of that firm. At the same time he became a student at the Conservatoire des Arts des Métiers, where he attended the lectures and studied the machines in the museum. He also took practical lessons in turning from a toy maker. After some time, this diligently occupied, he returned to Alsace to superintend the construction of the machinery for the new factory at Vieux-Tan, which was shortly finished and set to work. The operations of the manufactory were, however, seriously affected by a commercial crisis which occurred, and it passed into other hands, on which Heilman returned to his family at Mulhouse. He had in the meantime been occupying much of his leisure with inventions, more particularly in connection with the weaving of cotton and the preparation of the staple for spinning. One of his earliest contrivances was an embroidering machine, in which twenty needles were employed, working simultaneously, and he succeeded in accomplishing his object after about six months' labour. For this invention, which he exhibited at the Exposition of 1834, he received a gold medal and was decorated with the Legion of Honor. Other inventions quickly followed. An improved loom, a machine for measuring and folding fabrics, an improvement of the bobbin and fly frames of the English spinners, and a weft winding machine with various improvements in the machinery for preparing, spinning and weaving silk and cotton. One of his most ingenious contrivances was his loom for weaving simultaneously two pieces of velvet or other piled fabric, united by the pile common to both, with a knife and traversing apparatus for separating the two fabrics when woven. But by far the most beautiful and ingenious of his inventions was a combing machine, the history of which we now proceed shortly to describe. Hailman had for some years been diligently studying the contrivance of a machine for combing long stapled cotton, the ordinary carding machine being found ineffective in preparing the raw material for spinning, especially the finer sorts of yarn, besides causing considerable waste. To avoid these imperfections, the cotton spinners of Alsace offered a price of 5,000 francs for an improved combing machine, and Heilman immediately proceeded to compete for the reward. He was not stimulated by the desire of gain, for he was comparatively rich, having acquired a considerable fortune by his wife. It was a saying of his that one will never accomplish great things who is constantly asking himself how much gain will this bring me? 
What mainly impelled him was the irrepressible instinct of the inventor, who no sooner has a mechanical problem set before him than he feels impelled to undertake its solution. The problem in this case was, however, much more difficult than he had anticipated. The close study of the subject occupied him for several years, and the expenses in which he became involved in connection with were so great that his wife's fortune was shortly swallowed up, and he was reduced to poverty, without being able to bring his machine to perfection. From that time, he was under the necessity of relying mainly on the help of his friends to enable him to prosecute the invention. While still struggling with poverty and difficulties, Hailman's wife died, believing her husband ruined and shortly after he proceeded to England and settled for a time at Manchester, still laboring at his machine. He had a model made for him by the eminent machine makers, Sharp, Roberts and company, but still he could not make it work satisfactorily, and he was at length brought almost to the verge of despair. He returned to France to visit his family, still pursuing his idea which had obtained complete possession of his mind. While sitting by his hearth one evening, meditating upon the hard fate of inventors and the misfortunes in which their families so often become involved, he found himself almost unconsciously watching his daughters combing their long hair and drawing it out at full length between their fingers. The thought suddenly struck him that if he could successfully imitate in a machine the process of combing out the longest hair and forcing back the short by reversing the action of the comb, it might serve to extricate him from his difficulty. It may be remembered that this incident in the life of Heyman has been made the subject of a beautiful picture by Mr. Elmer R.A., which was exhibited at the Royal Academy Exhibition of 1862. Upon this idea he proceeded, introduced the apparently simple but really most intricate process of machine combing, and after great labor he succeeded in perfecting the invention. The singular beauty of the process can only be appreciated by those who have witnessed the machine at work, when the similarity of its movements to that of combing the hair, which suggested the invention, is at once apparent. The machine has been described as acting with almost the delicacy of touch of the human fingers. It comes the lock of cotton at both ends, places the fibers exactly parallel with each other, separates the long from the short, and unites the long fibers in one sliver, and the short ones in another. In fine, the machine not only acts with the delicate accuracy of the human fingers, but apparently with the delicate intelligence of the human mind. The chief commercial value of the invention consisted in its rendering the commoner sort of cotton available for fine spinning. The manufacturers were thereby enabled to select the most suitable fibers for high-priced fabrics and to produce the finer sorts of yarn in much larger quantities. It became possible by its means to make threads so fine that a length of 334 miles might be spun from a single pound weight of the prepared cotton and, worked up into the finer sorts of lace, the original shillings worth of cotton wool, before it passed into the hands of the consumer, might thus be increased to the value of between 300 pounds and 400 pounds sterling. The beauty and utility of Heilman's invention were at once appreciated by the English cotton spinners. Six Lancashire firms united and purchased the patent for cotton spinning for England for the sum of £30,000. The wool spinners paid the same sum for the privilege of applying the process to wool, and the Messieurs Marshall of Leeds £20,000 for the privilege of applying it to flax. Thus wealth suddenly flowed in upon poor Haleman at last, but he did not live to enjoy it. Scarcely had his long labors been crowned by success than he died, and his son, 
who had shared in his privations, shortly followed him. It is at the price of life such as these that the wonders of civilization are achieved. End of section 6 Recording by Hope Force 1